Come on. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for the Inexorable Word Nerd Live. And friends, uh, we have a wonderful show planned for you this evening. Uh, very cool guest, uh, some of which you know, um, hopefully. And if not, uh, you're going to get to know him. We're going to introduce him right now. I would like to introduce my first guest. Um, he's been on the show before. He is the creator of Forgotten Realms. He has also worked at Marvel and DC on their adaptation of the TSR content. Uh, he has published over 400 books, 300 source books for tabletop gaming, and a plethora of indie. I would like to introduce you all to once again to the most published man alive, Ed Greenland. Hey, Ed, thanks for coming, buddy. <laughs> Good to have you again. And uh, the fine. next Let's guest. Let's do this. I'm um, stoked. This has been great backstage. Uh, you guys, are, you guys are incredible. Uh, Okay, so we're going to bring in the next guest. Uh, my next guest, ladies and gentlemen, worked at DC for many years. Um, he was responsible for creating Blue Devil. Um, he drew one uh, Spider, or he drew Superman, he drew Batman, he drew Archie comics, he drew, uh, uh, he drew for Hanna Barbera, he drew Nintendo covers. He did a definitive run on Wonder Woman uh, that was written up in a cultural journal. Uh, where he drew her with muscle tone, which, uh, as we all know before that, uh, she looked like a housewife in a Halloween costume. And so this is the man responsible. He's fantastic. He's amazing. He's always busting lead. It's Paris mm -hmm. Collins. How you guys doing? <laughs> Was that too much? <laughs> all right. Well, now, while Paris is deciding if my intro uh was too much of a gush and has <laughs> completely embarrassed him beyond repair i would like to introduce our next guest uh she is the heir to bill finger the designer of batman she's an artist and a regular convention goer on the circuit a few years back she accepted credit um for the design work on behalf of her grandfather uh, from dc uh, you might have seen her at a convention you're going to meet her tonight it's athena finger Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Thanks. Uh, how's everybody doing tonight? Rocking. Oh, good, good, good. We've got some, uh, we've got some uh, material lined up uh, that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to gather all of you guys together um, so that um, so that we could talk about it, and then um, and and uh, and kind of uh, get people's feedback uh, from the chat. That we can, uh, if we could, uh, it's a it's a controversial subject. We want to talk about canon, and I think today um, we see a lot of companies uh, that are establishing canon over creators' work. Um, I wanted to bring you here, Athena, because it seems well to me that it's uh, one of the most prominent examples of of canon over uh, company canon or um, or creator ownership. And, and legalities of these things. Like I wanted to uh, to speak with you a little bit about uh, who your grandfather was as well. And we wanted to correlate that as well because uh, I think the reason why this subject is hot right now is because of uh, the Steve Ditko estate um, making their claim with Marvel for their, uh, for their family member, Steve Ditko, who's passed on. I think it's a very similar situation because now that Stan Lee's passed away, um, as we all know, in interviews, he was asked multiple times whether Steve Ditko was responsible for the designs for Spider-Man and for, um, uh, in particular, but also um, Doctor Strange. And so um, we have a similar situation and um, in similar circumstances now where the people have passed on who are involved and we're able to look at it without all the politics that are involved with it. You know what I mean? I think that's what happened before just my personal opinion but uh let's go ahead and start uh it off i think the, the best thing to do if you're completely comfortable with is just uh maybe if you want to talk a little bit about bill finger your grandfather maybe some 
uh, memories and what kind of person he was to you? Um, well, <laughs> Bill unfortunately passed away before I was born. So I don't have any personal relations with him. Um, unfortunately, I've learned mainly about him through other people. Mm. Uh, my family passed away on that side when I was a teenager. So I wasn't able to go back and re-ask these questions about stories that they told me when I was younger. There are certain ones that do stand out um, that my father has told me about when Bill was writing. Um, mm. At the time, my grandparents were divorced. And so he remembers spending time with his dad and hearing him type and going to museums and things like that to do research. But for my dad, it was just fun to go to the museum. But um, a lot of, you know, taking in the city and doing, um, you know, ideas. He had a gimmick book that he kept and things like that for writing these stories. Because he didn't just write for Batman. You know, he was the co-creator of Green Lantern, Alan Scott. He wrote for Superman. He even wrote for Marvel. Um, he wrote for other small companies. He wrote um, for TV, he wrote for the radio, he wrote a couple of screenplays. Um, so, I mean, he had a wealth of work that he's done in his career other than just what he did for Batman. But Batman was the biggest one that he was involved with and being excluded from having the credit for 76 years kind of falls into what's going on with Dicko but also what happened with Jack Kirby and with Siegel and Schuster and all these really important creators of that time, not truly getting the credit that they deserve for the characters that they had a part in. And so I think that with the Kirby case was really the catalyst for these other cases to get resolved or even approached. Um, yeah. I know that it helped sure. with my hmm. situation that they were able to resolve that. So it kind of pushed that trend for these original creators to That's get a great the credit. point. And That's so a great I point that we that... identified that starting point where uh, it made it possible to, uh, to approach these kind of things where you have a creator, a uh, canon versus a company that, that owns copyrights to work um, and for fans, people, so the fans know who to appreciate um, for that work and that people identify that there are creators behind these great works, people with passion like Bill Finger. Um, there was a lot that you mentioned that I didn't even know about his career. Um, and it was great to have you on to be able to learn that because now we see that this is a guy who uh, didn't just work on a pro on this very famous project. It was somebody who essentially dedicated his whole life to entertainment and loved it. And, and he really was a man of his craft. He really was about telling a great story. Um, he put a lot of detail into his stories. Like I mentioned before, he would do a lot of research. Um, so unfortunately, he was kind of known in the business as being late with his scripts. But you know, he was a perfectionist. He wanted to make sure he was handing in the best work. Um, as any artist wants to always hand in their best work, but you know, That's right. we're the we worst would credit. <laughs> we're the I want to say that. <laughs> I want to. <laughs> I want to say yeah, we don't see it, it all the time right. nowadays. <laughs> it's it's becoming a lost art. You know, it's becoming a lost art to take pride in your work. Um, I think, arguably, it could be a, a mix of of the corporate setting. I, I've There's had a, theory. a lot of factors into that, and I think that's a whole separate podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I could definitely talk about that for a long time. You're right. I absolutely think you're right. We um, so we mentioned uh, so so we mentioned that subject. We wanted to correlate it and speak about um, the current day, where now we have um, the Ditko family that's interested in, um, in acquiring rights to Spider-Man and to, um, I believe it was uh, Doctor Strange. Now, uh, a lot of people report on it. I think there's a lot of articles that are getting shared around and people are talking about it. But Paris, I wanted to invite you today. Um, you're my friend. We've talked many times about comics and theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one story that stuck out in particular when you were talking about your time over at DC after um, Steve Ditko had left Marvel and, and mm -hmm. came to DC. 
work. Um, I want to say it was slightly, it was shortly after uh, his fallout with Stan Lee, who was the senior editor at Marvel at the time. Um, and he, he left DC, he left Marvel and then went to DC. And you mentioned a story of having a conversation with Steve Ditko, our conversations. Uh, I wanted to bring you here today uh, to, if you were comfortable with it, if you want to talk about it a little bit and share with the fans, what kind of person Steve Ditko was. Fruity beer, non-alcohol, fruity. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, darn. Okay. <laughs> this disclaimer. <laughs> That's right. That, um, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I found it uh, not only just a pleasure, but an honor to to meet uh, Steve Ditko, and uh, and I bumped into him more than once. But uh, it was always uh, an interesting uh, bump, always, you know, most unexpected conversations uh, because uh, he he was legend, and I'd hear stories uh, about one thing or the other. I'd read about the, some of the things he was uh, doing, like the Mr. A. And everything else, and uh, just uh, was aching to meet him and got to do it. Um, I was uh, assigned to some work that he uh, he turned down. He he didn't want to do the Blue Devil, and um, he, he he had done it before, as far as he could say. You know, he was uh, it was just kind of getting off the creeper thing and and uh, going off to Atlas Comics, though nobody knew it at the time. And he was uh, 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 more interested in making his own thing and uh, making a uh, personal thing happen for himself. Well, meanwhile, um, DC Comics was hiring me to do House of Mystery and a whole bunch of other uh, new guy stuff. And um, uh, we finally got the started. He offered to, I, you want to try this? Uh, Steve Dickel doesn't want to do it. And then uh, you did a couple of these other things. So um, here's this uh, Blue Devil. Give it a, give that a shot. And I said, okay. You know. But in the meantime, they were offering me also another thing, and that was with Lynn Wing, and that was the Blue Beetle. You know, and uh, I had to get it done as quickly as possible. And uh, I was sometimes doing it close to walking into DC Comics as soon as I finished some. And this one job I had to do, it was uh, uh, six o'clock in the morning at in in McDonald's. I was just finishing the job and. And the, I have the page all right in front of me and everything. And then this guy started looking over my shoulder. I'm like, look at so, Maybe he likes my legs. I don't know. So I looked over my shoulder and I said, oh. And he said, uh, you, you're doing the Blue Beetle. I said, yeah. He said, uh, I know the Blue Beetle. And he says, not bad. And I said, okay, <laughs> thanks. And I told him about the... That was very complimented by it. Then I told him I knew who he was. He said he knew who he was. And uh, we just started talking. And uh, I got to ask him it's, uh, a lot of crazy questions. And he answered them. Um, he was very forward and very candid, which I was surprised. It was, um, And I talked to him about the working at Marvel and working at DC and, and everything. And, uh, and a very specific, very strange conversation that uh, I thought it was legend about, which uh, so I don't know whether it's, you know, it's really weird. I'm having this moment of shyness about appropriate conversation. And because <laughs> I told him, I said, well, I, you know what? I heard this story about the, um, you starting, uh, somebody starting a union, trying to make a, to get everybody together so they can make a union, so they can protect their work and all this other stuff. And he joined it and that you walked in and said, you didn't believe in unions and you didn't believe in that. And, uh, uh, you got everybody to leave the meeting, the secret meeting you were going to have. And he went, oh, yeah. And I said, you know, George Tusca and a whole bunch of other guys that were there and they just left. He said, yeah, I you know that was, he wasn't thinking about it that way. And I said, um, I said, but do you still believe in that? He says, not exactly. I said, um, well, I know which way to go. And then he went, he said, well, you know, back then, uh, they didn't have things like that, you know. Um, so going for them and getting something done and uh, protecting your rights for it and all that kind of thing, um, who could see the future coming? And I went, wow, maybe Bob Kane. 
you know, I think he you. was definitely one that had the forethought about the longevity of the character that he was, you yeah. know, a part of. Um, but really, I mean, no one expected, you know, any of these characters to still be around 80 plus years later, almost it's a that's, century, that's exactly, you know, and exactly. not going away. It's not like yeah. they're going to just poof, they're gone. No, they're right. part, of, or part of us. That's exactly what he said. He said, who, who think that they'd still be around? And I, yeah. but, and that's my answer was, well, I don't know, but Bob Kane had this idea about, about them being around. And so he, he kind of kept uh, a lot of things very close to the glove. And uh, I, I respect the idea, but I'm not quite sure that um, that's automatically it. I think it's a living process. You know, always, uh, Dick Giordano himself said, and I respect the man who wants to do it so much he's not really worried about the money. That the doing it is more important than exactly owning everything about it. Sooner or later, you'll get to do whatever it is and you'll get to own what you want. But if you never do it, it never happens. So it's more important that, the, that you desire to make it happen more than anything else. Yeah, that's right. We have to keep that passion and try to make our own things happen. But even having just passion for our work, I mean, I thought it was interesting when you talked about um, uh, doing uh, blue. Sorry, I live in a zoo. I have kids and my little guy's watching a show with his mom. And it's one of those shows that makes him nuts. And so he's screaming with the kids on it. He loves it. And he just he's hooting back there. He's like, it's like a, a little Ric Flair. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's what we got. Yeah, or he's howling at the moon. I don't know. It changes into another creature. It's uh, it's amazing. Who <laughs> um, fixes that? Yeah, or something. Yeah, absolutely. If we get his, uh, yeah, get get something, something, man. It's, uh, he's got some kids too. I think he gets that from his grandfather. So uh, that's not me. <laughs> Uh, but I thought it was interesting you mentioned Blue Beetle as well and your passion for that work and that Steve Ditko recognized it when you guys talked. Um, someone else who also recognized it was uh, Alan Moore as well when you created Watchmen. This was pre-Watchmen when you worked on Blue Beetle, um, and that was the inspiration for, um, for uh, what did I say, Owlman, right? Yep. Owlman was the, yes, uh, he went to D.C. and had uh, wanted to use... Uh, Captain Adam, uh, which was uh, his version, was uh, Dr. Manhattan. He wanted yep. to use Blue Beetle. His version was uh, Night Owl. And yep. uh, Roshek was the question. Uh, he'd gone and asked for specific characters from DC to make this story, and they turned him down. They didn't want to use the characters in this dark story, so they said, make your own. And so these characters, you can easily see the influence uh, from the DC characters that they were they were essentially constructed upon the story that he wanted to tell and then he just created his own and it was a smashing success. Um, but, you know, I think your work on, you know, I just thought it was interesting that your work on Blue Beetle was probably one of the direct influences. You knew Alan Moore as well, too. You, you mentioned to me when we talked that you spoke with him on the phone and so um, yeah, <laughs> it worked there, right? Yeah, worked there, but also it was. I would run into him at uh, conventions and everything, but uh, we took a liking to each other because he 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 had a very specific idea about the people and conventions and everything. And sometimes it wasn't a good opinion, but it was always an interesting one. And uh, we found ourselves laughing at the at the, everything going on at conventions, and it was fun. Always fun. I could see that as well. Um, <laughs> I could I could see that in him in his interviews and who he was too as well. So uh, I think it's spot on, man. I, I wanted to, uh, Ed, I wanted to talk with you as well. You know, we, you and I have had many conversations about uh, canon and and honor, uh, not even regarding your own work, just in general. Um, my opinions uh, about, uh, about the corporations uh, ultimately is I think we're in an age now where everybody is very self-aware of things that we spoke about, like Batman. Um, mm -hmm. the potential of successful IP to be profitable long-term. Um, I think that, that it's safe to say that these corporations are very aware of it. They have boards that talk about it every day. Um, they want to not only protect these profitable IPs, um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's safe to say that just from a business perspective and what we know just on a simple side of business, it's important for them to establish canon. Um, we've seen, what happened with Stan Lee when the fans um, get behind the creators 
um, and insist on them being recognized and, uh, and respected for their contributions. I think uh, his particular case was that uh, that the fans were making that they wanted to boycott because Marvel had made billions of dollars off movies and this uh, this property and and Stan wrote it for five dollars a week at Marvel years ago. You know what I mean? Uh, the um, and so uh, so it caused a problem that needed to be settled, even though it wasn't a court case. It was a matter of social uh, justice. Essentially, it was like this. Uh, the fans wanted justice for the creator that they cared about. And so the only reason why I bring that up is because I think corporate institutions want to try to avoid that kind of thing going forward, because it was obviously very expensive for them in that case. Um, they want to, you know, they want to establish the IP and they want to, uh, they want to own it. They don't want to get into litigations later. They don't want to share the credit for it. They don't want to do payouts. Um, and yeah. so, uh, I so, think that's you know, an unfortunate um, result of living in litigious times, uh, somebody might in the past, as a mark of respect, say, <clears throat> character X was created by so-and-so. But nowadays, their legal department says, don't say that. That establishes some sort of obligation. Whereas in the past, they would have been more easy to say, yeah, this is based on characters created by X or Y. And of course, it's always handier for a corporation that's going to sublicense things, you know, sell lunch buckets and bendable hand puppets and um, streaming TV series <laughs> and movies. Um, if the create the original creator can be conveniently dead, you know, so that uh, and I don't mean so much as that they have to give a slice of the pie, although that comes into it too. It's so that they don't have a live creator saying, no, you got it wrong. My character yeah. would never do that. My character would never put on blue tights. Let's, you know, my character would, would have saved that baby, even if he'd splat it on the sidewalk trying it. You know, it's right. inconvenient to have a living creator around who might disagree with the way you want to depict the character. And times change and characters change. And anybody who's collected, say, comic books, um, for as long as I have, they want to retell the origin story every generation. Mm. And they usually want to start with an issue number one that'll sell more with every generation. Mm. And they may, because times change, they may get farther and farther away from the original. And so it might they might be uneasy about what the original used to be. I mean, um, in the case of a the United States of America. I'm not an American. I'm a Canadian. So I, I look at my neighbor next door and I, but I'm standing outside the box of the culture and can look into it. And I see all of these um, uh, car comic book characters who all did their wartime propaganda in the Second World War. And they actually lampooned that in the first Captain America movie. They showed us a bit of that, you know, on, on screen. And, and, the characters change. I mean, the Human Torch came from Timely Comics before Marvel, exactly. you know, all this stuff. Yeah. And you look through all the incarnations and they've changed. And the people who, the team, it's always a, a creative team. And in comic books, the, the pressure is such that the team quite often changes pretty rapidly because people burn out or they have to bring somebody in to finish the pencils on an issue because some poor guy got hit walking to his car by another car because he was so asleep on his feet from trying to draw three books in a month mm. you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. somebody else steps into the team so the team is constantly changing and yeah the copyright holder the company wants to control the canon i, I think it's it i think it's also a human thing yeah you, you work I on it and you get owner you sort of feel ownership whether it was mm -hmm. your character to start with or not and it's sort of inconvenient to have an original creator hanging around. So I, that's why I always look behind me before I cross the road. You know, is, is this when they're coming for me? <laughs> is that what I do? I mean, I want to well, die hopefully like nobody takes you out. Right? <laughs> I think you're a global treasure. Hopefully nobody takes you out anytime soon. Oh, well, you know, it'll happen someday. I will fall out of the story and the story will go on. You know, it, it, it always does. You look at the Bayou Tapestry and everybody in that's been dead for hundreds of years. But they were still fighting and sweating and, and 
you know, trying to get the crown and everything because, well, they were there. That was their chance at the ring. They're grabbing for the <laughs> ring. And, of course, that's what makes all these creative things wonderful to read and watch. It's all the creative energy and the cool takes on things. And I don't want to stamp that out because sometimes having a team and a creative team that changes is great. Because if it's all one, one source for the stories, they tell their stories and then they slow down. And then they start retelling the same story unless their own life changes a lot. I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's probably a good time. You should give me verbal uh, permission now to do the comic series of you being run over. So that way you <laughs> sure. don't have any legal problems going forward. You know, we want to make sure that uh, the right guy gets the job, you know. But I want to be able to fly. <laughs> I'll make and I sure. I want to look handsome. I mean, I've got boobs, but I've also got this belly that they're resting on. You know, <laughs> when do I get those, that hourglass figure, the shoulders out to there, the square cut jaw? Maybe it's we'll, we'll, somewhere. <laughs> we'll make sure we get all that in there and the flight. So, But on the other hand, um, remember that, that closing shot in the movie Shazam? You know, when they're all in the high school uh, school cafeteria, public school cafeteria, mm. and they all got their trays of food and all the kids are staring. Slack jawed is what is presumably Superman walks in to join Captain Marvel. On the other mm. hand, wouldn't it be cool if all those kids got their moment of being a hero? <laughs> yeah. All different ages, all different degrees of handsomeness, all genders, all skin colors, instead of it's always guys in tights and if they're drawn the marvel way they never walk anywhere they leap with their legs 20 feet apart <laughs> and no genitals in between there's just a <laughs> archway you know <laughs> they're, 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 they don't things do things like go to the bathroom or or pick their noses or or get out of kleenex they never do oh any of that God. stuff the, oh. only person, the only person who ever had that problem was spider-man because of the webbing for his camera so he could earn the money for the Daily Bugle photographs. He was always, oh, I forgot my camera. Da, da, da. Or he'd almost get caught. Um, you know, and, and I think they did that once with Superman, you know, changing in the phone booth and then he runs up and it's one of those modern phone kiosks. No booth. No, there was. Uh, there, was big, <laughs> there was a big scene with uh, Peter Parker. His, his uh, costume got wet and it shrunk and it, uh, nothing yeah. fit. And the other one, he and there's one who went to the bathroom. He, there's yeah. one who went to the bathroom and that. Well, uh, somebody, one of, the, one of the DC artists for Soups was, he actually did a sketch at a convention where, right. you know, the phone booth has been replaced by one of those little emergency phones, which is just a phone on a pole with a little hood. And he's oh, starting amazing. to change. And there's a bunch of little kids looking at him. One of them's holding a balloon. One of them's walking the dog. And they're all staring at him. He goes, look, up in the sky. <laughs> so he can use his super speed to change in front of him. <laughs> yeah, because I was going to say that must have been tricky for him to hide his genitals behind the uh, the artist perspective <laughs> and all those panels where he had to change. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> if I'd been writing it, that would have been the time where he's trying to tuck his genitals and some little kid has got this kryptonite and he, and he oh a little kid God. holds it out and the genitals just sort of retract. Oh, I think that's my kryptonite being forced to be publicly naked and try to get a suit on before someone sees me. And I want to say that that's probably my weakness as of oh, now. <laughs> I wanted to add something, Ed, because you had a great perspective. Um, I wanted to add that in addition to um, your insights on uh, as far as Canon and the company, I think that it's, I mean, it's safe to say that in addition uh, to everything that you said, that these companies don't want um, don't want the creators to have power. Now that may sound like a harsh statement, but I don't think it's the, the power like I will conquer uh, all type of power. Yeah, I mean, well, except for Ed, if you give him that kind of power, it's going to go straight to his head. And uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> and I will use it to go straight to the fridge and open a bottle. Or can <laughs> open that bottle of jelly that's been sitting for a while that throws. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I would use it for practical stuff, absolutely. But uh, you know, it's a type of power where uh, it's an honorable type of power. It's a it's a type of power where a creator 
um, can have longevity himself, not just the characters that he created, where he can have credit for his um, for his creations and use that to establish a fan base and create on his own and um, and create income for himself based on the hard work that he's done, whichever creator that is. Um, that's been a hard thing to do nowadays, especially where a lot of the corporations, because they have production money and they have uh, control of all these very popular characters that everybody wants more and more and more of, um, you know, it's, uh, it gives them an easier opportunity to profit and, and for more people to benefit from it who weren't involved in the original creative process, um, you know, to each their own on what you feel um, is, is essentially fair is what we're talking about. But uh, as we all know, um, these are beautiful careers and you all had fun creating and, uh, and engaging with fans or going to shows and whatever it is that you're selling, whether it's artwork or yourself or books that you've already created and these kind of things, you have these opportunities to do it. But today where we have a crowdfunding platform, uh, I think that that is something that these companies talk about as well. Um, you know, creators branching off with taking the credits from Marvel and DC, creating a crowdfunding platform, and then uh, and having uh, essentially a retirement. You know what I mean? After years of service, the comic book industry and publishing, being able to go to crowdfund and have these fans follow you and spending money on these independent books from a creator that they love instead of spending money on these 80-year-old superheroes that we also love. Um, you know, that's the decision that people make. And even now it's not on everybody's mind to go and buy independent from people that they know or people that they trust or even new <laughs> people that are talented. Um, I think that's where we are in the balance right now. There's this uh, because technology is caught up. You know what I mean? Uh, print on demand is very easy. And um, people who are talented and people who are savvy uh, are able to create their own platform and their own wealth, essentially. Um, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, maybe it was a little harsh or hasty to say that these companies want to keep canon and they don't want that, that to happen or they want to establish, they want control over the market and they don't want these things to happen. But um, all evidence points uh, to the contrary. Uh, they, it's not profitable for them to promote creators. They often take talented people and cycle them out. They don't keep anybody in very long. Uh, like with DC, we have like Jin Lee, who's been there forever. But for the most part, of runs on these popular comic series. We have people that come in and rotate out um, and they don't promote the names. Very often, a lot of people are promoting themselves saying, hey, I got a job at Marvel. I'm inking this book. Check it out. But Marvel is saying we're putting out this book and this is the book and the character that we own. Generally, they might mention like a creative team once, but, you know, you can see what I mean. It's not profitable for them to promote creators uh, because it's very easy for them to have their own following and their own their own thing. You know, that's kind of the balance. And, and, that's, and yet, in uh, some ways, it's become better. When I was a, a teenager buying comic books, you'd never find a comic book that had a row of creators' names across the cover. This is true. And you'd quite often find a comic book that had a cover done by a staff artist who is not uh, there wasn't a, a single stroke of the pen inside the comic book from that same artist mm. so what you saw on the newsstand and yeah it was newsstands back then there mm. were no comic book stores you know <laughs> um you you saw this line look for the book and then inside would be somebody else's so in some ways it has mm -hmm. gotten better and then I think um, some of the companies have backlashed against that. And I, I think some of it is, is the politics and the history because you had creative teams leaving and forming entire companies like Image. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an excellent point. Yeah, the, uh, the fellas that left Marvel, uh, the founders created uh, Image of you know, Mark Silvestri, uh Eric Larson, you know, Rob Layfield, Todd McFarlane, and, uh, and uh, there's one more. Oh, Jim Lee as well. Mm -hmm. Were the five that started it. And so they left. It was a controversy, really. Really, that started on a controversy on its own where 
um, they were um, they were revolting against editors who were censoring their work. And so this was a common thing between the black guys. We were saying we didn't want our work, we didn't want our work edited and said, well, not so much censored, like somewhat censored, but also uh, edited as well. They were telling them how to draw Spider-Man's webbing, most famously because of um, McFarlane, but they'd all experienced it. And they they used that as a springboard to create image because they they rallied the the fans behind them. You know, it's kind of the same idea. Once you rally the fans behind you and then they break away and now you've got the third largest pub publisher in the world created by five guys that were essentially young punks that were, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just essentially five young <laughs> yeah. punks over at Marvel that were too big, thought they were too big for the britches, but it was, uh, it was something the fans could get behind and it became a profitable thing. Our, uh, Years ago, I was in an editor's cubicle and pinned up above the computer screen was a Jack Kirby panel of the Sentinels just charging towards you. And the dialogue box had been rewritten. The editors, they have broken th free with just <laughs> one thought on their minds. Destroy, destroy. destroy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I kind of... I kind of more like uh, sympathize. That's a hard word to say when you're talking about other companies and everything. And I worked for several of them. And like working for Disney, you you uh, you know you work for them, and uh, then you're not allowed to do certain things like uh, draw on your own time, being a right. uh, uh, being the <laughs> lunchroom, and, and I just be scheduling a little piece of paper, and then somebody actually comes along and says, uh, "You can't do that because mm -hmm. that they they got to own it." So wow. if you do that, you know, yeah. you, we, we, we got to do that. You can't do that. And so if every, these little nuances would show up, you know, I work for Marvel at DC and I, I turn in a, to see an editor for fun and talk about it, a character or something and turn the picture in. And uh, it's, as far as they concerned, it was an audition. And I get a letter with uh, Iron Man on it telling me that they have the right to own it and you can't say anything about it unless they give you permission. In any dimension, in any world, at any mm -hmm. universe, mm -hmm. they own this thing. And then what about the Iron zone? Man to tell you that the contract was ironclad and not changeable about what's important about it. And years so and years ago, of, they drew a dreaded right? deadline issue for the yes. Dungeons and Dragons comic. You know, which is the the extra issue you draw in case right. you miss press time or whatever, and then when you cancel the book, they don't want to waste that issue, so they always print it as the last issue. And in that book, all of us who work, uh, I didn't work at TSR; I was a freelancer. But because right. it was the Forgotten Realms thing, they drew me as driving a forklift of <laughs> Forgotten Realms lore through the aisles, and I got this release form from DC that said. Right. The payment of one one American dollar, the likeness of Ed Greenwood, shall okay. henceforth be owned by uh, DC. Well, right. I never signed it, and they never paid me the dollar. <laughs> so I guess I can still appear in public for the rest of my life. Uh, although you know, someone someone in the DC legal department is probably going what, and racing for their files right now. But on the other hand, they didn't pay anybody. For their, you know, the the, it, the contract says for the payment, which is hereby acknowledged uh -oh. and received. So if you sign it, <laughs> no, no, uh oh, and yeah, TSR, that's, uh, that's what makes it. TSR account. Michael just showed up. The uh, the shareholders, for, or these are the uh, the trademark holders for TSR. They just showed up. So uh, that's okay. Hopefully, we'll, <laughs> we'll just talk about Wonder Woman now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to switch. Switch companies. So, yeah, so yeah. Just talk about quick, quick, talk quick. about DC. Talk about DC. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now Michael's a good guy. He's great. Hail Ryan and everyone. He's a good guy. He's been on. Uh, he came on uh, a couple episodes ago. Chatted with us. Uh, last two episodes actually we did on here. He's a good guy. Um, and so, years uh, and years ago in Legion of Superheroes, DC lampooned Stan Lee. They, they brought in the character of Funky Flashman. <laughs> Which That's was one based on Stan Lee, yeah. Yes. And Stan Lee was at a convention, and he 
he turned to one of the DC um, artists and said, so does DC have any of its legal eagles here? And the artist said, I don't know. We don't know what they look like, you know, Stan. They could be anywhere. They could be among us. <laughs> and and he, says, he says, well, I think I need to sign a release form for Funky Flashman. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the DC artist went, Ooh, I think I have urgent business over there. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Holy God. I'm really glad to hear that she didn't take the dollar, Ed. Way to go, buddy. <laughs> they weren't offering her. I... They were just saying on paper that if I signed this sheet of paper, I would be acknowledged that I've received it. It's not a so, I said, so I said, Where's the American dollar? You know, they're yeah. worth a lot more up in Canada. That's worth almost four bucks Canadian or at the time, you know. Wow. So I said, where's the money? And they said, oh, we'll send it to you after we get the signed contract. And I said, ah, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I wasn't born yesterday. I was born the day before. So you, yeah. Nah. And that means a lot. So, that means a whole lot. <laughs> so you got to remember if you're dealing with that Greenwood, he wants to see, he wants to see bread before he makes dough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I want my pennies. <laughs> There's jars of them everywhere. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, yeah, I uh, I just felt like it was important to uh, to speak about this. And I actually just wanted to get all you guys together. And I wanted to meet you, Athena, as well. Um, I'm a huge fan. I, I remember um, when they had the ceremony. Uh, I remember seeing the pictures of it when it first came out in the news. Um, for you uh, accepting that honor. And then uh, recently I saw some artwork. I saw that you were on the convention circuit uh, doing yep. your own artwork. It was a yep. beautiful thing to see. If you guys want to follow <laughs> Athena Finger on Instagram, you guys can see a lot of her artwork and um, and you can get updated as to uh, what uh, what show she's going to be appearing at next. And you can meet her as well. Um, yes. I love meeting the fans. The fans are so important. They really are. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you for being artists and being part of the whole journey for these characters. I mean, you're part of, you know, our mythos for all of these characters now. And I just, I'm amazed by how much talent has come across the board for so many of these characters. I mean, it's just amazing. I, I've been, uh, being a visual artist, I like to see the variation of how people are portraying the characters and how they draw the characters and it's just mm. i love it so thank you thank you both thank oh, you. yeah fantastic anytime we're gonna have to get together and do this again i it just reminded me i get hanslow's in the chat said he came here to fanboy over ed um he said that you're a huge inspiration <laughs> on his work and uh, it reminded me that we were planning on doing a promo tonight. Uh, Gat Hanzo is a talented writer. He um, he wrote Vestige 1 and 2 uh, that did uh, over $150,000 together on uh, on Indiegogo. Uh, and he just launched uh, the issue one of Bullet Maker, which is in the same universe, graphic novel. Um, I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to submit uh, for a magazine idea that they had. And he decided to just do a mega issue which is very cool. Uh, I'm a supporter of the project. I own both of the previous books. I backed uh, Bullet Maker as well. So we wanted to uh, share the promo and show uh, I'm a proud contributor and this is uh, Gat Hensel's baby. So uh, I'm gonna share a screen here and show you all uh, this campaign. It's uh, Bullet Maker. It's at uh, almost 13,000 now for anybody watching as well. If you haven't wow. backed it, this wow. is a this is a beautiful project. It's uh, drawn by Joe Ball, and they decided to go in black and white. It's uh, inspired by Kentaro Miura's classic Berserk. You can see the, some of the uh, artwork here. Um, it's featured. It's very detailed. Um, this is a fantasy Western horror um, with the supernatural aspects, and it follows the Vestige universe. Uh, Oh, so it's like some modern artwork. corporate America. That's what you're telling <laughs> me. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you could probably make a correlation there as well. For uh, You could probably find some aspects for it. I know it's not put in there intentionally. I think we can find symbolism in just about anything um, today. But uh, this is some of the uh, – that was some of the artwork as well. There's some wonderful tears here. Uh, they actually did a metal cover. It's a, a rigid metal – full metal cover wow. um, with alternate art on it that you can purchase. 
Uh, there's oh, cool. lots of original art available, and there's actually a really affordable tier where you can get a uh, you can get a sketch from the artist Joe Ball along with a poster and some extras and your copy of the graphic novel. This is a, it's essentially the book itself is $25 and it's a hundred page graphic novel, including the bonus material. So the book itself is 48 pages and he's featured uh, 52 pages of independent creators work uh, in the back of the book, people that, um, that he uh, um, that submitted uh to um, to uh, Black Dragon Comics, and so uh, he selected people. We're very proud to have 13 pages in, and those bonus pages. I wrote three stories uh, for this submission, and uh, we've got some uh, preview material for Hayward Saints Eight in there. We got some preview material for the character Eternatech, uh, who's a big part of the Cornerstone Creative Studios universe, and we also have a. Uh, um, a five-page preview of Vault, uh, which is a beautiful fantasy story about a 16th century knight um, who is betrayed by everyone he cares about and becomes cursed, and, uh, and and his life is destroyed until all that remains is his oath. So I've uh, got some cool stories in there, and Bullet Maker itself looks fantastic. So make sure you guys back it um, mm. or tell your friends about it as well. Uh, when you go and look 111 backers now, um, it's only eight days in and we have $13,000 so far. Uh, wow. It's overfunded uh, 2,558%. Uh, so the, and this book is finished. is an important feature to mention as well. This book uh, doesn't need production money. This book is done. So when you back this and the campaign ends, these babies are shipping straight out to you. So there's going to be no wait time after close. Uh, essentially just the time to wait for your shipping and for it to arrive. Uh, it's all yeah. you will have to wait. So... That's um, the best. Fan, fantastic business model uh, way to go guys and so uh i love it i love it but that that brings up a really interesting thing when creators are running the show you can mm -hmm. do flexible different things that a large corporation after they've had their executive meetings and signed their big contracts they can't pivot and turn quickly Unless they no, license it takes something. time because they have to go through the legal tape of making it happen. Yeah. Which is too bad because it does stifle the creativity flow. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember conventions when I was a little kid where old men would come up with their kids to get something signed from a comic book artist. And the old man spent all his time whittling. He had a sharp knife in his pocket and chunks of wood. <laughs> and he would whittle one of the, the characters, the comic book characters, and he'd hand it to the artist. Here, this is for you. <laughs> and that'd be the coolest Holy thing smokes. the artist got <laughs> at that convention. And you'd see the, the artist, his face would light up, light up like he was a little kid again. But it was like, can you do more of these? And of course, if it's a large corporation, uh, can you meet with our legal, can you fly out and meet with our legal department? <laughs> and here we go. But if mm -hmm. it's one-to-one, -one, it's like, oh, wouldn't that be cool? And then a new idea is born and a new way of doing things. And mm -hmm. there, there were little kids who used to make their comics and sell them and distribute them in, in class, in school. And they just basically did chat books by getting an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, getting three of them. <laughs> turning them sideways, folding them, then stapling them with the school stapler. <laughs> Ta-da! You know, and it may be crude as anything, but if somebody, oh, okay. if something happened in class or happened in society that was big, like the moon landing or a president getting assassinated or something like that, they could draw a comic and have it for sale in the schoolyard halfway through the day. They didn't have to have editorial meetings. They didn't have to have a you know, a colorist and an inker. They just did it. And so that, that flexibility is something that gets lost in corporate. Totally agree. Yes, I agree. <laughs> now, Gat was saying he has something else for a campaign setting. They were talking in the chat about Bullet Maker being a campaign oh, no! setting. You were... <laughs> uh, he mean, said he's got oh, yes. something else planned for that. He's already looking ahead for those steps as creators. You know, we, we think of those My things for our subject, wallet. things that inspire us. <laughs> yeah, freak yeah, you here in the background. That's my wallet. <laughs> yeah, you open up your wallet and then you just get more. You know what I mean? The more fans open up their wallet, uh, the more they're going to get. 
it all across the board, all aspects of entertainment, what you, what you give money to is what's going to, um, it's going to prosper from that money and from multiple fans doing that. So you were talking about, um, you were talking about creating a, in school, creating these books. And I, as a preteen, I did the same. I, we were talking about Oriental Adventures the other day. And when I was a preteen, I think that was my first book I published. And it was so sad. Like it was on notebook paper with the holes. And I drew it and colored it with colored pencils. And I made my own ninja class. And I like was all out. I made like multiple ninja classes. And I had all these options. And I went full all in and my dad was so proud of it that i wrote actually created this book out of notebook paper that was it was something like 20 pages so it was 10 pages front and back right. like it was just he was so proud he he lit essentially like laminated it like he did the edges with duct tape like he did because we're a bunch of hicks he always had duct tape around because the pages wouldn't tear so the mm. edges all had folded duct tape on them <laughs> and i used bread ties through the holes of the notebook paper after oh, it was boy. like this duct tape notebook paper color pencil monstrosity that i was just completely proud of i drew up a cover and everything and like yeah so i mean i must have been 10 when i did it so yeah oh my god <laughs> that's where it starts mm -hmm. <laughs> and and if you send two copies to the library of congress it's as official as anything <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, maybe. I didn't even know Congress existed. I was just happy. I think it was inspired by Mortal Kombat, too. I was, uh, I had a lot of stuff going on. Oh, they're <laughs> so, so young. <laughs> they're like Mortal five God. things could inspire me to do any one thing at any one time. So, you know, probably a total mess up here. Mm. <laughs> the mixing, the melting pot of society and, and uh, entertainment. You know, I came up in this with all the media and the video gaming. I started in Atari and stuff. And so, uh, you know, you guys work essentially and um, and everybody's work together in film and all of it. So it's an inspiration. You guys, the work that you've done and any work that you show as well, you know, Athena, Ferris and Ed, uh, when you go to a show or any work that you've done that people see previously inspires new generations, people going forward. Um, it's a beautiful thing. I know that you guys inspire me and you inspired me again tonight. Um, and hopefully you inspired uh, people in the chat or watching or we're going to catch the playback. Probably going to call it a night. Um, but it's been so good uh, having you guys here. And uh, I wanted to be respectful of everybody's time because I could talk forever. Like the inexorable word nerd thing is not just a moniker. Like I never run out of things to say and I'm constantly having to veto stuff. I, I have three things to say at once at all times. Uh, I was one of those kids that, yeah, I was the I was the motor mouth that everybody. Uh, that was everybody's prominent statement was that wow he talks a lot, and that was my that was my defining <laughs> personality trait. <laughs> Which probably means talk. To to say. <laughs> now you're just going to tell those stories on paper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they keep it in here and try to project it into something productive instead of. Uh, yeah instead of word nerding <laughs> word nerding myself right out of a conversation <laughs> I mean, that's what keeps it moving that's what keeps it moving you know no I, but uh, any comment i have is specific about that is more wrapped up in the idea that the uh, independent publishing and uh, independent effort is what uh, keeps all of this going you know we do we concern ourselves with uh, how often and how much um Corporations control, as you said, the word canon, the history, and everything is wrapped around the, this product that another company, a corporation owns, and maintaining that uh, sense of history, or that sense of property that uh, belongs to the thing. And then everything gets a little mixed up in the end. But what always saves it in the end is the very interest of this product. So fans always uh, come up with a new way some way for something to happen. Uh, I worked for a company called Kamiko, and uh, that was in Norristown, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, actually outside of Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, Norristown. And uh, they created stuff like the Elementals, uh, what's that other thing called? I remember what it was. Um, yeah, these uh, host of characters, a very uh, interesting uh, product and everything, and everybody started uh, doing a whole lot of work for them 
in one way or the other, uh, mage. They did mage. And uh, uh, the, the company started thriving. And then they started hiring people to do a certain thing here and a certain thing there, like Robotech and all that stuff. But uh, I wound up getting a little job working down there because they had uh, they were folding. They weren't uh, they weren't going to be there. Somebody else bought it. This new guy bought it, and he had uh, all this executive energy and this. Uh, uh, he saw as the the company and all things that uh, had anything to do with it as fully his, completely his, and uh, that no matter what happens. They're the ones doing all the work, and what everybody else does is just kind of a, a ride along. In the, and they should just be grateful that they got the job and grateful that they, they got whatever little money this guy would hand out. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in the midst of that, there was a job they owed me for something. And uh, I he, he said, well, come on down and get the money. And I came to get the money, and then he gave me this long dissertation of how he's doing me and the company and every other freelancer a favor. But while he was talking to me, he was, you know, it was old Kamiko. Behind him was a set of Xerox machines. And he said, uh, you know, and you know, I was just doing you a favor. And I went, stop, stop. I said, you don't even know it. You're about to be supplanted. And he went, no, 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 no. And he said, what? What do you mean? I went, look behind you. And what I said was a big, giant Xerox machine. I said, I, you know, it was new to me, but I understood the process. I said, um, that thing right there, anybody, like you can buy a car, you can buy that Xerox machine. And if you can draw it, buy that Xerox machine, if you can buy that Xerox machine, then you can print up your own comic books. If you print up your own comic book, then who needs you? You know, I'll tell you something. In just a little bit, your world's about to change. I don't know, I, but I see it now because you're standing there next to it. And I left, and uh, Kamiko got uh, bought up by what a Japanese uh, comic book company that uh, took over and just started putting out a whole bunch of books, and the, the stock went right out the window. Uh, manga something, I forget what it's called, and they put out the Ninja uh, Ninja High School. They put out a book called Ninja High School. It just blew up. The whole world was selling and buying the property. And Mage obviously went out the door and the uh, other thing uh, got bought up. One and thing that was very hard for me to accept, you know, that reminds me of a story. It actually involves you, Paris, as well. And hearing you talk now, I love you, man. You're a good dude. Um, you were very good to me when I started out and I didn't know shit about uh, about comics. Right, here, I want to bring Gat Hanzo in as well while I tell the story and while we talk. Hey, Gat, how's it going? How you doing? Uh, I just want to say uh, thanks for bringing me on. Thanks for the promo earlier. Uh, before I fanboy a little bit of Red, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, Paris and Athena, hello. Why couldn't nice you be a pretty girl? girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Ed. I'm sorry, Ed. I, I apologize, brother. Yeah. I can act like okay. a pretty girl if I'm if if we're playing D and D though. So I have a little bit of a oh. LARP in me. You heard him, Gat. You have to take your shirt off. Oh no, here no, we go. No, no, no. <laughs> We're not getting naked with Ed. No, 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 let's not do that. I'm, I'm sure this is a family a show. show. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's another company. Yeah. <laughs> keep, keep it PG, I guess. Okay. All right, fair no, enough. Uh, Ryan, I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to say thanks, though, buddy. I mean, you know, we got, you know, there's a bunch of good stuff in the back of that book, and you know, I've been out there promo and bullet maker. I don't think I mentioned you guys enough, so yeah, I really appreciate all the promo. Um, you know, as you know, there's very few people that kind of want to take on and look at my pro project for whatever reason. Um, we, it's not really something to get into right now, but yeah, um, I appreciate the promo, brother. I appreciate you guys being part of the project and. I think we're doing great here. You know, shortly we're going to be shipping these books out. So I think that's what matters at the end of the day. Customers are going to be happy. They're going to get their books yeah. on time. And, yeah, they're going to be thrilled with the product. So thanks, Ryan. Hey, no problem. Hey, I appreciate that, guy. Yeah, I was happy uh, and proud to contribute uh, since day one when I started the pages. Uh, I know we had some extra time, so I just kept adding some more work. Um, and, and just give as much as I could because uh, I wanted to give some quality work. I believed in the cause. It ended up transforming into the mega issue now. 
Uh, but yeah. that doesn't change how I felt about it, man. I, you know, I made a promise that uh, I wanted to uh, deliver and you're giving something, it was something essentially a project that was giving to create to independent creators that was featuring them and allowing them to share the work with fans who love comic books and love good story. And so we wanted to honor that by giving them our absolute best. So uh, just like you sure. do when you make yeah. these books and publish them, man. Well, you know, that's what it all started off as. We were kind of given, you know, a bunch of ind independent creators a chance to put their work out there in front of people. Um, and it kind of, you know, over time things happen, you know, um, people fall out and there's situations that arise and it wasn't correct to do anymore. You know, it wasn't the correct business model for what we were trying to do. Um, you know, there's a handful of guys like you that, you know, still wanted to put their stuff in the book and they wanted to be a part of something. And so I feel like printing something is, is the best way to get it out for people to really actually feel the pages, look at it. I'm the type of guy who likes to smell books. I know that sounds weird, but um, <laughs> I'm a 100%, I 100% believe in physical copies of, of anything, whether it be a comic book, a movie. Um, you know, I think that stuff goes out of style with the digital age, and I hate to see it go. I'm one of those guys who likes the old school stuff. I like the way it looks and feels. Um, so what yeah, you're I saying is you're a spine sniffer, book. brother. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a spine sniffer you're right like you know i think a lot of people walk into libraries and they're like well i can't stand the smell of a library well man i'm the opposite you know the old musty books man that's great I, I yeah, absolutely i'm the same thing yeah you know? it's nice to have it in your hands and own it and have it in your library so you can revisit it you can revisit things on the internet but it's definitely not as uh it's definitely not as uh, intimate. I've heard people use that word before, but for me, it's just more, uh, I just like owning it, having it in my collection. That's the point of having the collection and having the artwork in physical form printed. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I like that as well. We were talking, uh, Gat, when you came in and Paris was talking about his experience with some company um, that he was working with. And it just reminded me of my first experience. Uh, I did my first convention with Paris. He actually flew up from New York uh, to represent uh, my first show uh, with me and back me up. Him and Denise as well came, and you guys are both amazing. I was very new. I was a greenhorn. I was still learning aspects of scripting, and I was getting referred to people. And I want to say that weekend early, uh, Jesse referred me to you as well, Jesse Hansen. And uh, I think it was absolutely perfect. You were awesome live. Um, that was so much fun that weekend. We got to go and uh, – you know, show our work. Um, you actually uh, grappled me during your, uh, <laughs> during it. I don't know if you learned that technique when you were in the Marines or what, but I just felt these incredibly strong hands grab me by the shoulders and strong arm me into an interview uh, and gave me the tail end of your interview. They came to talk to you and they end up talking to this nerdy kid who has no fucking idea what he's doing. So it was like uh, this whole thing, but it's the big also, switch. <laughs> yeah, like Paris was incredible to me. Like, uh, I really appreciate that your insight in our conversations. Uh, it really helped me when I was starting out. It was a complete inspiration. But that, the weekend, there was kind of a sour side to it. And, uh, you know, it, I also realized in the same week, weekend, like, how awesome somebody who works in the industry or works in these uh, uh, works in this is, and then how shitty somebody can be. And, like, I remember at one point the convention owner, you were doing a panel and you were filling in a panel for somebody who couldn't make their panel and you were doing a live drawing and you're like, well, I need a pad. I need something to, so I can show them. And you were doing live inking. Right. And so, uh, you did that and they took you downtown to get you the stuff. And the guy was, uh, uh, the guy was strong arming me over the $20. He had a guy give you a ride to go get a pan, to go get this, uh, this pad from Staples for your panel. He was trying to strong arm me for the 20 bucks. He was mouthing off. Uh, and and so I gave him the 20, you know, I came back and talked with you about it and we got him the 20 bucks. But uh, this was a guy who put on an entire convention and had, you know, I lined, uh, I set it up uh, so that we could have that corner. He was kind of difficult about every aspect of the thing. And I just kind of saw firsthand, like, especially the conventions can be kind of dirty. You know, we see oh. it a lot. Like, yeah. Again, yeah, they can be the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, look, it's human. It's human it's being. Some it's people need business, control. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. But I think I think it was an eye opener. You know what I mean? When I thought about it after at the time, I was just kind of like, why would they act like such jerks? But this is supposed to be a comic convention. 
And this guy's got 35 years of his life into this. And he was insulting more than I'd like to even admit he was insulting the whole thing. Um, the guy's a total piece of shit in my book, Chris. Uh, but, you know, the point that I, I think it just kind of opened my eyes that uh, the profit and, uh, and what's important to these guys, a guy, you know, it was kind of interesting to me like a person who's running a comic convention doesn't give a fuck about comics or the history of it you know what i mean and so that made me think for a little bit about the business side of it and what's real and what's not and so you know to tell the story wasn't so much to be a downer or to out conventions for being dirty but just well, to put the point on know, it i've seen that with the mega conventions you don't see that but with the smaller ones these promoters have their fandom and so they want to promote their fandom and they don't really care the relevance of their fandom or other fandom when it comes to holding a comic convention. So uh, people who understand what it is, because <laughs> I've been to many I've been to ones that are the smallest of the smallest and five people show up and I've done San Diego Comic Con. So I've done mm -hmm. everything in between. And so you have to take that in consideration, especially with the smaller ones. Who's really running the show? Um, what is it that they're really trying to get from their show? Um, mm -hmm. What is it that they, what kind of a crowd do they want? Is it going to be a heavy, intensive creator artist show or is it going to be heavy in the cosplay or whatever it is i mean there, there's a big wrestling thing here in florida and a lot of the smaller conventions like to have the wrestling involved with their their cons either having mm, yeah. more wrestlers there or doing mm. um you know amateur wrestling at night and things like that so you have to kind of take that in consideration um and don't take it personally because it's not about you. Unfortunately, it's about <laughs> them. And you got to just say, Makes all sense. right, that's what you want. It's not the best approach. It's not the way I would do it, but okay. I guess I um, could look at the positive side of it, even though they uh, they shook me down for $20 for an art <laughs> pad from Staples. <laughs> Essentially, him and his redheaded, bearded uh, associate, whoever he was. But, yeah, with you know. his associate too. They t yeah, they double they double team me. Uh, but <laughs> although, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> they shook me down for twenty dollars. Okay, uh, essentially. But Paris, like I had so reassured him. What you're telling him, us is you're a cheap date. <laughs> well, they had to assert well, their power over someone, so you were just an easy mark, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yes, so. again, that goes into it's high pressure for these people who are running conventions. So we've totally deviated, but whatever. Um, I let it go. No, let's. I let it go because we were having. I think it totally pertains, pertains to the conversation that in the end, it's a performance art, and the show must go on. And yeah. uh, Paris, whether, that's your tagline. And, you got that in there again. That's right. Okay. And no matter what, no, no matter what happens, who, you know, because you're wearing the big hat, man. You're the one wearing the big hat. And uh, your two taglines that weekend were "The show must go on" and "I worked for everybody." Oh, and right. we had the one was uh, "Free lunch." That's right. We got free, free lunch. lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I got down the, I got down the main, and you, you, your boy was out there handing out lobster. We we ate. He, this guy was handing out lobster. We had lobster, comic books, and lobster. Hey, hey I didn't get any to lobster. It. It was <laughs> I didn't get a lobster. To lobster. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. Oh my god, but it was actually, so good. <laughs> that brings it around in a circle. Yes. If you're thinking about, you know, why do we all work on so much stuff? Why did Bill Finger have so many credits? That's right. Well, one of the part of it is he got addicted to food. He liked to eat. Mm. You you did what you did to put food on the yeah. table. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Or his I friends would help food. him. Because he was so <laughs> destitute at the end that his friends were feeding him. Mm -hmm. Because That's right. he didn't have money for food or even his rent or That's anything right. else. 
That's mm -hmm. very sad. And that was actually something I wanted to touch on too. And I'm glad you brought it up, Athena. I I'm so sorry to hear that. And that makes me sad as well, because us talking here uh, with, with uh, talented people, people who love to create, um, you take that situation where you're working for uh, large companies and you work, uh, you know, and, and create and you give it over for a paycheck working in the moment. There's no retirement for that kind of thing. You know, when you do passion work, there's no retirement plan. Oh, well, there was no retirement. And a lot of the golden age artists and writers got phased out. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as they started requesting to have health insurance, they were cut so fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they got, I mean, depending on who they were, but they got like the side stories. Here, here's a crumb. Here, write a few stories for this obscure title that we have just to give you something to do. Um, mm -hmm. It's not enough that we're going to, you know, be obligated to give you health insurance or give you retirement options or anything like that. Um, no, Bob Kane secured all of that for himself um, and mm -hmm. knew the position that his quote unquote friend Bill Finger was in at the end of his life and still decided to hold on to his fame and his money and his lie, basically, that he did everything himself. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and unfortunately, this is not, you know, unique to Bill's story. A lot of beautifully talented people are ignored and they die without anyone noticing. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that was yeah. kind of what happened with Bill. I mean, nobody noticed that he was gone for two days. Wow. And then his friend found, you know, kind of went in to go check on him. And it's tragic. I mean, look at how when Bob Kane died, he there was celebration. You know, there was a mention about it. It was known. Not for mm -hmm. some of these other really important people in that generation of these creators. And without what they did, we wouldn't have, you know, your careers or other people's careers or even the tangents that have come off of this. And so it really is heartbreaking when you hear that these people weren't honored later in their life. From the companies yeah, that's right. that they dedicated their lives to. I mean, Bill worked mm -hmm. for DC for a very long time, yes. very long time. And there was no loyalty to him other than here's some crumbs, mm -hmm. which is tragic. It really is. We see this kind of thing happening all the time and the examples are here in this panel and they're in the subject matter that we talked about. You know, sure, Steve Ditko's family's looking to get uh, a credit. They've filed paperwork with Marvel for rights for Steve Ditko, who unfortunately has passed on. Uh, but just for honor, um, I think the reason why that situation is what it is, is just like you mentioned, uh, Athena, is that uh, Stan Lee was alive. Many interviews, he was asked about Steve Ditko's, uh, his involvement in the creation of Spider-Man. Uh, he never verbally said once that Steve Ditko was responsible for the image of Spider-Man, even though we all know he can't draw for shit, right? You know, Stanley can't do anything as far as uh, line work. He was a writer only. A lot of times the artists were just spearheading the picture, the uh, the story, because they were drawing it first. And he was putting in the word bubbles after just to make the uh, just to kind of make the artwork move along and to help with dialogue. So, uh, you know, now that Steve, Stanley's passed on, um, I think it makes it more it makes it possible. His popularity and, and the fans behind him people get fanatic about it mm -hmm. um, especially when the person that they admire is alive at the time unfortunately i think after they've uh you know he and steve dicko passed away people can look at it uh with a clarity i think without all of that nostalgia and without those kind of things and just kind of look at it for what it was that um you know whatever they decide you know i'll leave that up to everybody to make their own opinion about it i have my own and i've voiced it uh, everybody's allowed their opinion, you know, but I think we see the examples here as well with Paris Collins who created um, Blue Devil for DC. He's uh, They've written a, a cultural journal article about his work on Wonder Woman that changed the character forever and she's still drawn the same way that Paris drew her 
back when he uh, pitched his project, passionately pitched his project to DC and was given that uh, that run on Wonder Woman. We see the same thing with Ed Greenwood, who created an entire universe. Uh, yeah, he's humble. He won't say anything, so that's why I'll say it for him. I don't give a shit. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> that, uh, that he created... He created a world, a universe of fantasy that inspired generations of people. Uh, they made nearly 20 video games based off of the Forgotten Realms property, yeah. including, oh, in, man. including uh, Eye of the Beholder. They have uh, Baldur's Gate 1, 2, and 3. I think That's they have right. 3 coming out now. They've got Neverwinter right. Night, Neverwinter Online, uh, and a plethora of other ones. Um, and so, uh, you know, all of this work that he's done, but uh, you know, uh, new uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which is owned by Hasbro now, uh, this humongous corporation that most of the time doesn't even publish their own books. They have to be third party licensed. They don't care about publishing and they uh, and this company uh, doesn't care about who created this work that they're profiting from. Um, uh, you know, I understand it, Ed. I, you know, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but I mean, a lot of us fans love you. And the point of it is that, uh, you know, fans can make that change. We can support the people who are living today, people who are living legends like this. And as you can see, you know, that was the idea tonight was to to uh, speak with everybody, um, uh, with Ed Greenwood, with Paris Collins and Athena Finger, and get their stories and hopefully make people more aware about these kind of things, that there are talented people behind, there are faces behind these things. It's not a large corporation logo that's pasted on these characters. There are people who love uh, creation, who've created these things um, and with their lives. They've essentially used their lives to create these things. And, um, you know, we have people that are still alive today. Hopefully it's, we don't have that tragedy where you wait until they're gone to appreciate them. While they're right here living and breathing, it's strong and want to create for you, want to draw for you, support them now. You know what I mean? Support them now. And you've seen these this panel, all of the people that are in this panel with me are talented people that you can support now for the cost of a piece of artwork, for the cost of a graphic novel, for the cost of a uh, an independent uh, tabletop RPG, the cost of an inspired artwork um, from somebody who uh, from somebody who cares about it. Like all yeah, of support that. us now and avoid <laughs> the rush. <laughs> <laughs> Let us enjoy the fruits of our labor, please. Okay. <laughs> we also accept free lobster. Yeah, free lobster. For anybody that's... As, <laughs> I grew up in Boston. I'm all about the lobster. There you go. All I'm all about the stuff. milk and butter. Yum. <laughs> I'm all about the lobster and the cheddar. So if you guys... <laughs> if you guys uh, are listening. So, <laughs> so go back, Bullet Maker. Support all of these guys. You can find them all on social media. Uh, and contact them. Um, we'll post some links after on, on our social media as well. And we'll get some in the description when I edit. Uh, but, you know, uh, reach out to them now that you know what they've created and the things they've been a part of. Look, uh, look these people up. They're all very talented. You can go and see them at a show or you can support them on crowdfund or you can support them uh, even over social media by commissioning them um, or supporting work that they have out now. Um, Ed has multiple independent projects that are out now, tabletop RPG projects that you can support. Um, and so, uh, and uh, Paris Collins is still drawing. He's still doing shows. Actually, Athena Finger's still doing shows. I mean, Get Hanzo has a book that's active now. It's only been up for a week on Indiegogo. So uh, open that wallet up and support people who are passionate and care about this, okay? So we're going to call it a night. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll be sure to have these talented people back again for another show. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you thank all for you coming as well. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you for so having And it, great to meet you, Paris and Athena. Yeah. Great to meet you. Very good to meet you. Hail Bullet Maker. <laughs>